The Shemitah year is a year of rest. It is a year in the agricultural society of Israel where they were commanded by God to, to desist, to cease from working in the farm. Now, there is an interesting pattern that has been discovered where this, this ancient, uh, ancient way of resting in the seventh year seems to have a correlation to the financial markets and the stock markets today. And we'll be sharing more about that as we go. But that's why we've got this, uh, this picture here of business people really hanging on for, for the dear life, hoping it's going to work out all right. Now, uh, today, like Melissa said, we don't want to scare you. We don't want to say it's all doom and gloom. But what we want to do is to give you some keys to be able to stand in, in this time so you'll actually be going up whereas other things might be going down, okay? So we will be going through some practical stuff. We'll go, go for a bit about the blessings of the Shemitah and also the curse of the Shemitah. And finally, we'll end up with what it's all about, the trumpet, the trumpet sounding, heralding the Lord's coming. At the moment, the Shemitah is highly talked about. It's in financial news media, all other Christian news media. Even secular Indian news outlets are talking about it. I don't know why the Indian news are talking about it, but Indian news outlets are talking about it. They think it's very interesting. It's all over Facebook. Have you, have you any of you seen anything about Shemitah on Facebook? No? <laughs> who, are you, who are you friends with on Facebook? You know, come on. You know. Uh, it's all over Facebook. All right. And actually tonight is the night of the Shemitah. It's the last night uh, of the, the seven-year cycle. And uh, we'll be looking at the lessons we can learn from this and we'll connect the dots to the sounding of the trumpet. Our goal is to get over onto solid ground spiritually and financially, being ready for anything that might come. I know you've been talking about uh, stewardship, financial management here for some weeks. And really that is something that's very important and we will be connecting in with that as we go. So what is the Shemitah? On slide two, we go to Leviticus 25. We've got it on the screen, so uh, you're welcome to look in your Bible too. This is the, the chapter about the Shemitah. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows with its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it's a year of rest for the land. And it goes on to describe that um, whatever grows by itself in the field at this time was to be for everyone. So no one could claim ownership of it. It was available to the people who really owned the land, to their servants, to, to anyone in, in the community, even strangers, even people who are not part of the community of Israel could come and help themselves on this year. So there is a releasing of the land, a releasing of the harvest to everyone. It was intended as a time of blessing, a time of rest, just like the Sabbath. So for the Jewish people, God commanded them one day in every seven they were to rest. So in six years, they would have, in seven years they would have rested one whole year. And God commanded the same for the land. He, he commanded that the land too would rest for one whole year in seven. Now God's purpose for that is, is for blessing. He is an amazing God. Many uh, religions out there will, will make people work very, very hard. Even some in, in, in Catholic circles and so on are working very, very hard for their salvation. They're whipping themselves. You might have seen from the Philippines. They, they whip themselves, crucify themselves. It, it, it is horrible to watch, but they're working very, very hard to try to gain salvation. But our God actually commands rest. He doesn't command striving. He doesn't command struggling. He commands you to rest. And he commands the, even the land to rest because he cares not just about you and me, but he cares about the land. He cares about the animals. And it goes on actually to describe that anything that grows for itself is to be available to the animals of the field. Next slide. One of the blessings of the Shemitah year is safety. Again, we're in Leviticus 25, verse 18. It says, You shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them. 
and you will dwell in the land in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit, and you'll eat your fill and dwell there in safety. Notice how he says twice, you will dwell in safety. Now how on earth does not farming the land keep you safe for an enemy invasion? What's the connection between taking a break from farming and protection from enemy armies coming in and stealing your goods? There doesn't seem to be any logical connection. Now the rabbis point out that the word translated statutes there is a word that refers to a, a commandment that isn't necessarily logical. It doesn't necessarily make sense. God is commanding his people to do something that in the natural doesn't make sense. And in the natural there could be no connection to resting the land and having protection from enemy armies. But God is a God who sometimes commands us to do things we do not fully understand. And there's a real test. Are you willing to do something you don't understand? As a kid, when mum would tell me to do something, I'd say, why? I'm told to do the dishes, and she wants me to do the cutlery first, and then the plates. I said, why? You know, I want to do it the other way around. It makes more sense to do it the other way around. No, 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 you have to do it this way. And I find it very, very hard to do something I didn't understand the reason for. If I understood the reason, there's some clear scientific reason why you have to do the cutlery first, then you do the plates. Okay, all right, but there's no clear reason. Why am I supposed to do it? So I would ask why, and even sometimes I might feel the Lord is speaking to me, but my question is, why? Why do you want me to do that? I don't understand. But God is calling us to be a people who are saying, Lord, here I am to obey you. In the scriptures, they, they said, here I am, Lord, speak to me. Here I am, I will follow you. In the army, the, um, you, you, you're not supposed to say, why? You're not supposed to start asking questions. If they tell you something, you say, sir, yes, sir. Right away, sir. You know, you, you'll be straight on to it. And we are part of the army of God. God is calling us to walk in his ways, not to be asking all kinds of questions. Why should I do this? Why should I let the land rest? Why am I going to be protected? No, we're going to do what he tells us to do because we trust him. Now, I want to show you in a moment a video. I'll just explain a bit about the video. It's from um, the Gaza War last year. And it's about uh, some rabbis who were looking to harvest the field ahead of time because there's just been now this year of rest where you're not supposed to grow anything. So they cannot go and harvest the, the wheat and flour that they need during the seventh year to make their Passover unleavened bread. So therefore they have to find something they can, they can harvest in the sixth year that is not ripe and they're going to store it up for a year and a half and then they're going to use it. Now we'll show this video and we'll show the connection between them doing this very peculiar thing that God has commanded them to do and God actually uh, blessing and protecting them from what could have been an awful terrorist attack. Next slide on the video. On this day that there was supposed to be a ceasefire, that Israel was eight days into the war, there had only been an aerial campaign. And Israel was convinced there was going to be a ceasefire. The Hamas had uh, assured the Egyptians, the Americans, and the Israelis through the Turks and the Qataris that, yes, they were going to accept this ceasefire. A half hour before the ceasefire begins, they open up with a barrage. It was something like 120 rockets that day. I remember that. That was really sleight of hand to take our attention off of what they were going to do yeah. that afternoon. That afternoon they were going to launch their first terrorist tunnel attack. Several days before, there are a group of religious Jews from Bnei, Ra Bnei Brak who have a small factory that makes what's called matzah shmurah. Matzah shmurah means literally watched over matzah. It's like the uber kosher matzah for Passover, which has to be watched over from the time the first seeds are planted. They have to be planted according to all the biblical strictures. Mm -hmm. um, they're watched over all during the growing process. Mm -hmm. And uh, every seventh year, the land has to lie fallow. The, the land gets a Sabbath as well. It's a sabbatical year. So this group of religious Jews was looking for a large field of very green, unripened, tall wheat 
that they could harvest immediately and store for two years because next year there won't be any wheat. They look all over Israel, they can't find anything that meets their needs. Finally, down in uh, an area called Otef Aza, which is like the envelope of Gaza, right, right, right on the border, they find acres and acres of a wonderful field, five feet tall, super green wheat, planted according to all the biblical strictures. And they go to the farmers and they say, we want to make a deal to harvest all of it right now. And uh, the farmers said, well, you know, we want to make sure we get the price for it that we would pay in September. And they sure. haggle back and forth and they say, it'll be a good deal for you. You won't have to work these extra two months, no irrigation, right. no upkeep costs. Um, Just the expense of growing it, they won't be yeah. allowed. And uh, you won't have to sell it piecemeal. We'll take the entire crop. You won't have to sell a little here and a little there. But we must harvest today because every day that goes by, we're losing the ability to store it for two years. We right. want it at its greenest state. We're right now less than 3,000 meters from the border. That's a closed military area. It's the closest we've been yeah. so far You're on the border. Close to Gaza land right now. Yeah. As you can see, this field's been harvested and plowed under already. Two days after they harvest the field, 13 Hamas terrorists pop up from a tunnel right in the middle of the field. In the middle of the field. And if you take a look over here, you'll see, not revealing any military secrets, everybody knows it, there's eyes in the sky, there's an observation balloon. Right, it's like a... And I there wasn't are, sure what that was at first. There are cameras all along this area, and there's a unit of female soldiers, all female, all girls, who watch monitors 24 hours a day because boys don't have the same powers of concentration. No, they don't. When they popped up, as they come up out of the tunnel, they do a ninja somersault and then look around going, where the heck's the wheat field? <laughs> this was supposed to be our camouflage. Yeah, it's amazing. Instead of being invisible, they're now visible to everything. They're totally exposed. A 19-year-old girl sees them. She immediately sounds the alarm. There's an aerial asset that engages them, hits them with a missile. We have a special ready response team that engaged them within 90 seconds. Half the terrorists were killed. The other half the terrorists were driven back down into the tunnel. And every newspaper account that you'll find will tell you but for those religious Jews who were following biblical strictures, we would have had a disaster. So it would have been five foot tall uh, wheat field there that they would have come out and hiding. Because it's all green, so it's not going to be how I was afraid. So they thought it was a nice safe place for the tunnels. Now they did have equipment in the tunnels like tranquilizers, um, of course weapons. They were planning mass kidnapping, so they were deliberately going near areas where there were a lot of civilians to try to... To, to kidnap, and they even had fake uh, Israeli army uniforms there, so they were ready for a major surprise attack. But instead, they were surprised as they came out. And where's the f where's where's the field? Where where's all the wheat? But it was a protection as as these people were doing this very strange and unusual command, and they were harvesting the wheat very early. So sometimes it's hard. We don't understand why God is telling us to do something, but I want to tell you it's very important to actually do what He tells you to do. I know sometimes uh, we might have a hesitation. We want to go somewhere, we plan to do something, it's very important to us, but it's just this nagging hesitation about it, and, and there's just this strange feeling about it. Sometimes we can push it aside, and no, no, it's all right, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, knock it off, you know, well, let's get going. But God is actually speaking to us, and he wants to alert us to things, and sometimes Christians actually... Um, get into accidents, get into different things like that, simply because they didn't listen to the warnings God was giving them. So we need to follow his, his, his warnings, follow his leading. He'll make it very clear to you. So don't be afraid, but as he leads you, say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? Are you saying not to go today? So there's a blessing of safety. There's a blessing of protection as we follow the Lord and do things his way. So that's one of the blessings of the Shemitah. Now, the next one I want to talk about is fruitfulness. Now, can you imagine telling a manufacturer to lay off his workers, close his plant, cut off his suppliers, forfeit his customers for a whole year, while at the same time he has to cover his rent, pay off his loans, maintain his equipment, and feed his family? From an economic point of view, keeping the Shemitah is insanity, absolute insanity. 
But what does the Bible say? It says in Leviticus 25, 20 and 21, If you say, What shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow, nor gather in our produce? And the Lord says, Then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it will bring forth produce enough for three years. There's a promise of fruitfulness as we do things God's way. And this applies, for example, regarding the Sabbath, regarding having that day of resting and seeking the Lord. Sometimes we feel we're so busy, we're busy with homework, we're busy with the tasks we have to do, and so, no, 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 I don't have time to seek the Lord now, I'm going to do, I have to do all these things first, and then I'll do it afterwards. But God is telling us that as we put him first, he's going to be a blessing. So we have enough to cover, cover the time we, we need. When I was in high school, we had important exams coming up, but at the very same time, it was a worship conference, a, a 24-hour worship conference. And so there was a question, what, what do we do? Do we go and spend hours worshipping, or do we stay home and, and uh, prepare for exams? And a number of us decided we'd go. We went to, to, uh, to the worship conference. We spent hours there worshipping, and it was so worth it. It was so worth it. And the Lord helped us in our exams. We did well. We did well. Now I want to show you an example uh, of the, the blessing that comes as someone decides here to rest in the, sixth, in the seventh year. And we'll see how it applies in our lives. So let's go to the next slide. Now this is meet, uh, meet Moshe, Moshe Donino. Say Shalom Moshe. Shalom Moshe. Moshe is uh, Hebrew for Moses, or actually Moses is English for Moshe. Okay? So Shalom Moshe. Moshe Donino is a farmer in the southern Israel. He's got 60,000 square meters of tomatoes, 200,000 square meters of squash, 25 workers, 10 Thai, 15 Arabs. He's an exclusive supplier for McDonald's and for one other major company. In 1994, he decided not to keep the Shemitah, and it was a mysterious virus that affected most of his tomato crop that year. Now, in 2000, he was wondering, well, do I keep the Shemitah? 2001 was coming up. And three months before the Shemitah, he had a bumper crop. The other farmers in the area, they were just running around in circles. Not much was happening. But for him, he had a large enough crop that would, be, that would be for him to live on for a whole year. In addition, the tax office contacted him, discovering he had paid too much tax in advance and gave him a 20,000 Israeli shekel refund. That's about 5,000 Australian dollars. That's not bad. So he saw God's blessing in the sixth year, as was promised, I will bless you in the sixth year. And so he decided, okay, I'll go ahead. I will take the Shemitah, I'll have the rest. He had no guarantees he'd be able to keep his lucrative contracts with McDonald's. He had to find alternative work for his Thai workers, and maybe they wouldn't come back. So what happened in 2001? Well, that year there were Arab riots. And so the Arab workers, they were not coming anyway. In addition, tomato prices hit rock bottom. So all the farmers around them who were not keeping the meat, they were losing money because they, they just couldn't, couldn't make ends meet. The best thing to do in that year was to rest, and that was what he was doing. God blessed him in the year before, and he had enough. This is a real person. This is a real story from the Jerusalem Post. There is a principle that as we step out to follow the Lord, he will bless us, and it requires great faith to do it. It's amazing to think that he's willing to, to, to lay aside his whole business for a whole year like that. That requires tremendous faith. Now, sometimes we think of faith as blindly stepping out and hoping that God will kind of catch us. Next slide. We think it's a bit like this. Okay, we put on a blindfold. We hope it's all going to be okay. And we take a step of faith and hope it's going to be okay. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, God is faithful to his promises. But sometimes we're not quite sure that we've heard from God. We think that maybe he has said that this and this is what I want you to do, but we're not actually all that sure. And we feel the pressure of time, the pressure of our environment, and we say, I better, I better just step out. I better just do something, even though I don't really know. Sometimes that will work out all right. Sometimes it won't. Okay? Now, I, I have spiritually speaking, done that a few times. I stepped out in faith, but it was just my hopes that this was what the Lord was saying. I was missing the timing, and I went tumbling down the mountain. It hurts. It's painful. Okay, now God upholds you as you believe in his word, as you follow his commands, as you follow his timing regarding what he's calling you to do. But there's a time where he's telling you to wait. And we're so keen and so eager to get going with what the Lord is telling us to do that we step out a bit too early and it can be rather painful. 
I find it very interesting that God here gave the farmers in Israel, he gave them a confirmation in the sixth year that he wanted them to rest in the seventh. So he gave them extra supplies. He gave them what they needed. So there was a little sign in a, in a sense that um, I'm going to look after you. I'm going to provide for you. He was giving that re, re, the confirmation that they needed. We hear sometimes people will say that you shouldn't ask God for confirmation. If you do, you are sort of doubting. You're doubting what he's telling you to do. But I was surprised as I started to study this that there are many people in the Bible who asked for confirmation and God gave them confirmation. He didn't just require them to step out in blind faith. He was strengthening their faith. He was encouraging them. One example that came to mind in particular was Gideon. Now we know how he asked God for a sign. He asked God for something to show him that this was really God's call in his life to go and face the armies or the enemy. And God gave him many confirmations. And so finally then he took the lead. He had 300 men and he then approached a massive enemy army. Now, if you've got 300 men and you approach a large army, you better be careful. Okay? If this is not going to work, you better have an escape route. You better have something worked out. Perhaps you should try a little safe corner of the army. But instead what he does is he surrounds the enemy armies. He, He blows the shofar. He calls out the sword of the Lord, the sword of Gideon all around the army. He is waking them up. He is asking for trouble. Okay, now if God is not with him, he is going to be whipped. And everyone with him are going to be killed. And there will be massive, disastrous consequences. So he needs to know that this step of faith he's going to take is of the Lord. And so God gives him confirmations. He asks for confirmation, he gets confirmation three times. And then God gives him a bonus confirmation, a fourth confirmation. So as you are about to take momentous steps in your life, as you are seeking him for direction for the future, don't be afraid to ask for confirmation. He will give you the confirmation you need. I'm thinking of Moses as well, who had been exiled from Egypt. Death threat hanging over his life. He's finally settled down. He's got a family. He's got a a wife and young kids. And God tells him, I want you to go back to the place where there's a death threat hanging over your life. He had to be careful. He had to know, is this really God? And God gave him confirmation after confirmation. So whatever you are seeking the Lord about, ask him for confirmation. Ask him to make it clear. Don't be afraid to ask. And he will make it clear to you. He will strengthen your faith. So the Shemitah is a test of faith. It is a test. Are you willing to step out and follow him? And he will give you then the confirmation and enable you to to go out and do it. It's like in, in the business, I, I never want to be in business because I thought it would be hard. Uh, I, I'm a sole trader uh, as a web designer and I never want to do that. I want to be employed by someone, nice and secure. And it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. But as I followed God, as I obeyed him, he held me up, he lifted me up. And that's, that's true for these farmers here, that's true for you. As you follow God, he will lift you up. He will enable you. So this is part of the, the challenge of the Shemitah, or the, the faith challenge, but also the blessing that comes. As you step out and follow him, you have testimonies to share with others of how he led you, how he provided for you. Going on to the releasing of debts that Melissa mentioned earlier. Next slide. Uh, that's right. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. And this is a form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbour shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbour or his brother because it's called the Lord's release. Now again in the natural it doesn't make sense. You know, why should I let go of the debt that someone owes me? I mean it's my money. They borrowed my stuff. I want it back. And I want it back with interest. Thank you very much. But God has a different way of doing things than we do. He, he teaches us in, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There is a principle here of letting go, letting go of things. Even in the business, I, I have people who, who owe me money. Now, I, I do what I can do. I pray, I, I remind them, but there are times when I have to simply let go. I had one particular episode where this man got me to research for ages about a project he wanted, contact all kinds of people to get them involved, I spent hours and hours and hours on it over a few weeks. And then when it came time for the invoice, he said, oh, you just did it as a hobby. You you, you didn't ask any payment for that. It was just your own volunteering. 
said, no, it wasn't. No way. I had been working hourly basis for him up to that point, and suddenly he thinks I'm a volunteer. Very, very strange. And I, I kept on communicating with him, trying to make him do the payment, do the right thing, and he just got more and more abusive. And in the end, I simply had to let go. Let go of that debt. It was hard because this is my money. This is what I, I belongs to me. But God has a different way of doing things than we do. And so part of the Shemitah is releasing debts, releasing those that owe us something. Now, releasing the debts in society would help break the endless cycle of poverty. Where so many people today, you've got the, the rich and the poor and the, the gap is widening. But in biblical Israel, every seven years, there'll be a, a bringing together where those who were so wealthy were letting go of some of the stuff they had and those who were so poor were suddenly getting, being released from the, the chains of, of poverty. They would actually do it, as we'll see here, it says at the end of every seven years. And so that is what's very special about tonight, that tonight is the time, it's at the very end of the seventh year, when they would release debts. And we'll be talking more about this in a moment. So keep that in mind, releasing debts on one particular day. So we've looked at the blessing of the Shemitah in terms of safety as we follow the Lord, fruitfulness, strength and faith, and the release of debts. Now we're going to look at the curse of the Shemitah. Next slide. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, Leviticus 25 gave all the instructions regarding the Shemitah. But the very next chapter, Moses sees ahead, and he describes Israel not keeping the Shemitah. In fact, he describes them living in the land for a long time and not keeping the Shemitah one single time. And so he predicts that they will not keep the Shemitah. He predicts, of course, that they will enter into the land. Now, it's amazing that he is speaking so confidently that you're going to go into the land because they're not there yet. They're in the desert. There's giant, giant armies in Israel. He's got confidence. He knows what God has said. He knows he's going to get there. But he also knows that they will not follow God's commands. They will not step out in faith in this area. And ultimately, God would send them into exile because of it. It says the land shall be left empty by them by the Jewish people, and will enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despise my judgment and because their soul abhorred my statutes. See, they abhorred his statutes. They abhorred the commandments they couldn't understand. And they decided not to follow. Next slide. We read in, at the end of Second Chronicles 36, it describes how Israel was gradually getting worse and worse. Gradually there was an increase in the sinfulness of the nation. And God sent prophets. He, it says that he rose early in the morning sending them prophets. It's a picture of him working very diligently, wanting to turn his people back, bring them back on the right path, but they were not listening. And so what happens is that finally the king of Babylon comes. It says... Uh, about those who, who were not killed during the siege. Verse 20, verse 20. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him, to the king of Babylon, and his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So the timing of the judgment on Israel ultimately linked to the Shemitah year. They hadn't kept it for 490 years, so 70 Shemitah years they had missed. And so God sent them into exile for 70 years. The timing was related directly to the Shemitah. So just as so the Shemitah would be a blessing, so here it was becoming a curse. And it's interesting to note that it says that the land was to enjoy her Sabbath while they were away. God is calling us too to enjoy our Sabbath, to enjoy the time of rest, enjoy the time of not doing anything. But sometimes we get so busy we, we simply don't do it and that can build on and on and on and on and on. Ultimately what happens then is that there will come a time when we simply have to have that rest where suddenly we're not all that well anymore and we need to have an extended catch-up because we haven't rested. So the land here had not rested and so the land was granted a rest by the Lord. And God has ordained for our bodies too to have rest. A time of refreshing, a time of waiting. One of the farmers who, who uh, would, would take the, take the Shemitah 
he explained how the Lord blessed him financially. He entered into the Shemitah year in debt. And of course, he was not farming for a whole year. And at the end of the, the Shemitah is already after the planting of the new crop, so he plants his new crop very late, and a small crop. But the Lord blesses his crop, and he, he has an abundance in it. And so he not only manages to pay off his debt, he has an abundance. And he, he describes how the Lord got him out of debt by him keeping this, the seventh day, the seventh year, the Shemitah. But he also describes how it was a blessing for him to have spend more time with his family, to spend more time studying the scriptures. And really that's what God is telling us to do as well, to spend that time in seeking him. So if we don't take the rest when we should, sooner or later we might be forced to rest. And so the timing or the judgment for Israel was based on the Shemitah. We read in, in the book of Daniel that he, he was a prophet and he studied the scriptures. And as he studied the scriptures, he realized that the time for Jewish people to return to Israel was at hand. Why? Because it was the time of the Shemitah. The 70 Shemitahs had passed and now was the time to return to the land. And in that same chapter, God gives him a vision of the panorama of world history and he, he sees what's known as a 70-week prophecy. We won't go into detail about it. But in, in that vision, he sees the Messiah coming. He sees the Messiah being cut off. And then he sees a final week where there is this evil, evil figure arises and there's, there's uh, what we know today as a tribulation, that last seven-year period. And so he starts to see a, a vision of the rest of history of mankind based on the Shemitah, based on seven-year cycles, the timing of the first coming of the Messiah, the timing of the second coming of the Messiah, all based on the seven-year cycles. So the seven-year cycles are crucial. It becomes a time-setter for judgment and a time-setter for blessing. It's interesting to note that the Shemitah appears to be still in effect, in particular in the financial realm today. Now the word Shemitah means to release, but it also means a few other things. For example, it means to shake. Uh, we read in the Bible how the, the ark of God was carried by, uh, by oxen, uh, and David was leading it, and it says the, the, the ark, the, the cart, shook. That word shook is Shemitah. We read in the Bible about uh, this Queen Jezebel, who was a wicked queen, and she was thrown out of a window. The word thrown out and thrown down is the word Shemitah. Now, so we're talking about releasing, letting go, throwing down, shaking. And when we apply this to finances, it gets quite interesting. Next slide. There we are. Shemitah years. So a messianic rabbi called Jonathan Kahn has been studying this and he's um, found a, an interesting correlation between the years, the seventh year cycle, and financial issues affecting the stock markets. Now this is figures for the US stock market, how far down it went in each of, each of these Shemitah years. And as you can see, it was quite a wild ride. Now, the stock market to me seems a bit abstract, but what I do know is that when the stock market goes way down, it starts to affect me and my business, it starts to make it harder to find work, more and more people lose their jobs. So it becomes a very practical reality in our lives. Uh, next slide. Now, tonight is what's known as the last, the last day of the Shemitah when the debts were released. Now, in 2001, on this very day, there was a crash of the US stock market falling by 7%. In 2008, there was another crash of the US stock market on the exact same day on the biblical calendar, which is equivalent of tonight. On the um, secular calendar, 2001 was uh, 17th of September, uh, 2008 was something like the 20, 22nd of September, so the dates are a bit different on our calendar. But on the biblical calendar, they're actually the very same day. Now, it's, it's interesting to note that these things were happening on those very days. Now, for these two past collapses to occur on the one and same day in seven years, require the working together of all financial tra transactions globally. It required a working together of all stock markets across the world. No one could have orchestrated these crashes to happen 
on those precise days on the biblical calendar. No one but God. The rabbis say there's no coincidence when God's involved. No such thing. And when we see something like this happen, God is trying to bring us a message, trying to bring us a warning. In some ways you could say that we've had two strikes. In 2001 we had September 11, the terrorist attack which resulted in the fall of the stock market on that day of the Shemitah. 2008 we had a giant crash. Now, 2001 people in the US, they flocked to churches, they ran to churches, they were shaken by September 11, they were shaken by the finances, they ran and they filled the churches, they were keen to hear what is God saying. But after a few weeks, they stopped coming. They, they went back to the ordinary lives. In 2008, with the financial crisis, people weren't flocking to the churches. Um, instead, the governments were stepping up to the plate and offering all kinds of things to try to help. But now, today, the debt problems that was in the private sector now belongs to the government. The level of debt is higher now than in 2008. The last time the stock markets were this volatile, as they are right now, is in 2008, seven years ago. The last time the Australian dollar was so low was seven years ago in 2008. The last time oil prices were so low, seven years ago, 2008. I could go on and on and on, but you, you get the picture that there seems to be something going on. We had, of course, the Chinese market uh, crashing just, just uh, a few weeks ago. Now, is a third strike coming? That is our big question, because we can see what has happened historically, and we know that today the stock market is not open, so there's no, no crash happening today. Good news. Okay, good news. Sigh of relief. No crash happening today. Good. But ultimately, God is using these things to warn of judgment. And the big question isn't our financial spreadsheet, it's our spiritual balance sheet. Spiritually and morally, our governments are rushing away from godly standards, abandoning his ways, promoting sinful lifestyles, in an accelerating and unprecedented way. It's amazing to watch. And I think actually all of you have seen the change in your lifetimes, in my lifetime. We know from the scriptures that unless there is a change, unless there's a change of course, ultimately a third strike is coming. Ultimately there will come a time when things will shake even further because God is wanting the attention of people. Because God is merciful, he wants to bring people back to the right path. So his purpose in these things is not to scare people, it's not to kill people, it's not to destroy people, but it is out of his mercy that he seeks to correct their path. Just like a parent can get very strict with a little child as that child is starting to poke around in the uh, poke around an electrical device or, or whatever, the, the parent will get very angry straight away and will stop that kid, or that kid is trying to, to play with matches, the parent will come quickly and stop them. Not because the parent hates the kid, but because the parent loves and cares for the kid. So what is the answer? What's God's word to us as believers at this time? Next slide, Jeremiah 39. The time of Jeremiah, judgment was coming. Judgment was coming, but there were people who believed in God, people who followed the Lord. And so Jeremiah was given a special assignment from the Lord to speak to one man that had, had helped him in the past, a man who, who believed in God and honoured God's ways. And God gave this man a specific promise. He said, um, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'll bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and that shall be performed in that day before you. I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you put your trust in me, says the Lord. So here this man, would, he would not be untouched by what's happening. Around him, enemy armies would be coming into the city. People would be killed. Different bad things would happen. But this man, as he was trusting in the Lord and following the Lord, it would not touch him. That is, in a sense, what I feel is, is the Lord's word to us as well. That as we trust in him, it doesn't mean there won't be trouble around but as we trust in him, we can be protected. As we follow his ways, we can be protected. Jonathan Kahn, the rabbi who talks about this, says, what's the answer at this time? Where is our refuge when everything is crumbling around us? And the answer is Jesus. His name in Hebrew, Yeshua, means salvation, means, means refuge. So if you're looking for refuge, you're looking for protection in a time of need, he is that safe place, he is that fortress, 
Outside of him, you're on your own. But in him, there is protection. Next slide. In the Hebrews, the Lord is actually giving a promise. Now, this is not a promise that we like to quote. He says, um, he has promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. God is promising to actually bring a shaking not only on the earth, but also heaven. And the word there in the Greek, I believe, refers to the universe, refers to the things out there in space. God is saying, I promise, I will shake the earth and the galactic bodies. Now this, yes, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let's have grace by which we serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. God is shaking the things that can be shaken, that our trust is not in the things that can be shaken, but our trust is in what cannot be shaken. For all of us, even as Christians, are things we put our trust in, whether it's a close friend, whether it's a career, whether it's our studies, whether it is um, what people think of us. God allows things to happen where those very things that are so important to you suddenly are taken away. You say, God, why? I'm following you, I'm serving you. Why? why are you doing this to me? It's not fair. But he has taken away the things that can be shaken, that what cannot be shaken will remain, that you can stand firm in times of difficulty. One author spoke about the, the need uh, in our own lives to um, not rely on external input. You know, sometimes it's... Of course, it's a real blessing to have our friends encouraging us, come to church, get encouraged. But what if suddenly those friends aren't around? What if suddenly you can't get to church? How will you manage? How will you cope? Do you have the foundation in your own life to stand strong without that external input? And that's what we need. We need to have that foundation strong in Him. And so God is allowing a shaking that we're not relying on these other things that we can be strong. I know of a missionary training school in, in Britain where they train missionaries to go into uh, very dangerous countries where they will not have fellowship with other Christians. And they're training them to be able to stand on their own in a setting like that without external input, without lots of book, books and tapes and films and whatever, but to be able to stand firm in their faith in the Lord no matter what. And then to be a light into a dark place. That's what God is calling us to do as well, to have that foundation in Him. Next slide. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So don't trust in your bank balance. Don't trust in the things that can pass away. But trust in the Lord. Now, why is God allowing this shaking? Why are these things going on? I believe it's to wake us up, to make us alert to what is going on. Now, I've got a friend who's just so hard to wake up. He came with us to China and uh, it's 10 a.m. getting to 11 a.m. and he's still in bed. So we turn the lights on, so he covers his, his face. We start to make a lot of noise, he puts his pillow over his ears, he can't hear us. We start to shake him and he just grunts. <laughs> so we start to pull, pull the doona and he pulls back but you know, finally, he, he, he gets up over time. God allows a shaking because he don't, doesn't want us to miss out on what's going on. I've actually got a video there on the next slide of uh, time to wake up. The dog's just trying to sleep, you know, but uh, when you've got someone helping you wake up like that, Oh, like sometimes we don't want to wake up in the morning, but there's, there's, a <laughs> there's a good purpose to wake up. God's got a plan. There's a new day coming. Now, the night after the, uh, the Shemitah, the night after this shaking, begins what's known as the Feast of Trumpets. You see, the Lord is, is trying to wake us up for a purpose. And the, what is the Feast of Trumpets? It is actually a, a feast all around one purpose, one purpose alone, blowing the trumpet, blowing the shofar. 
Actually, I'd like to take you uh, to the next slide, First Thessalonians 4. And Paul here describes the return of the Lord. He says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The scriptures actually say that God does not want us to be unaware. He doesn't want us to be unaware of the times and seasons. He doesn't want us to be unaware of the time of his coming. Now, it does give a warning to the dead church that they will be unaware. They won't be awake. They won't know what's happening. And he says he will come as a thief in the night because they're not watching. But he's telling us to watch. He's telling us to be ready. He's telling us to, to, to listen for his coming. And so he is waking us up. He is allowing a bit of a shaking like that cat, licking the ear, scratching the ear. He's, he's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. I've got something special coming. I've got a plan for you at this time. It's not a time just to live an ordinary life and do ordinary stuff. It's a time to say, Lord, I'm here to follow you. What do you have for me in this season? What's interesting about this slide... Well, next slide. What's interesting about the Feast of Trumpets is it is known as an unknown day. Now, it is the only feast that is based on... The, the, the new moon, so the, the, sli- the, the sliver of the new moon in the sky would announce that the time has come for the Feast of Trumpets. So just as the night, night sky has become so dark, no natural light from the moon, you know, that little sliver of light appears, they know it's time for the Feast of Trumpets. Now they wouldn't know exactly when, and it would depend on two witnesses having seen it and then going and testifying to, to the priests, saying, yes, I saw it, this is what I saw. Jesus said that no one will know the day or the hour of his coming. And this is a typical reference to the Feast of Trumpets, to the time when no one will know exactly when the trumpet would sound, but they would be getting ready. They would know the general season. They would know that it's only a few days away. There were many signs indicating that they were getting close to the the sounding of the trumpet. One sign where the final harvest were ripening. We are seeing a harvest of good and evil. Another sign will be that the Jewish people will start to return to Jerusalem from all the nations around. We are seeing this. Just in the past 12 months, Jewish people returned back to Israel from 97 countries. But another sign that would happen once in every seven years would be the cancelling of debts and, and people exchanging notices saying, OK, I cancel your debt, I forgive your debt. That would be happening just in the lead up to the sounding of the trumpet. And it would result in financial changes in the nation. Today we are seeing this, that sign, the sign of the Shemitah, affecting the finances. There is a shaking going on. But the purpose is not about the finances. The purpose is about the trumpet that's coming after it. In the scriptures, God describes um, money as being the very least of all. He says, if you're faithful with what's least, then I'll entrust you the true riches. Here on earth, we tend to think the other way around, that money is so important and, and uh, people maybe not so much, depending on the person, of course. Let's go to um, Exodus chapter 19. I don't have this on the slide. Exodus 19, verse 10. We're getting to a close in a moment. And I just want to read to you a, a portion of Scripture from Exodus, which I believe gives us a picture of the time when the trumpet will sound. Exodus 19, verse 10. So here Moses has been meeting with the Lord and God is wanting to meet with his people in a very special way. Exodus 19.10 And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready for the third day for on the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of the people on Mount Sinai. Now we are waiting for the Lord to come down in the sight of the people. But in preparation for that, he says that they were to sanctify themselves, they were to wash their clothes, they were to get rid of anything in their life that wasn't pleasing to the Lord. Because they knew that the king was coming. And we read in verse 16. 
It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud. So all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the, at the never part of the, of the mount. So the trumpet was sounding exceedingly. Take note of that. And it goes on in verse 18. Mount Sinai was altogether in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke or a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. It sounds quite intimidating. And we read later on that even Moses himself says he was terrified, scared stiff. What's going on? The Lord was descending upon the mountain and we are waiting for him to descend upon another mountain in Jerusalem. And let's take notice of verse 19. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai on the top of the mount and called Moses to the top. Take note here of this trumpet that's sounding louder and louder. Who is blowing the trumpet? It doesn't say, but it must be the Lord himself or one of the angels is sounding the trumpet. And it is a dramatic picture for us at the time when he will come. Or there's this sounding of a loud trumpet. God wants us to be ready for the time when the trumpet sounds. When the trumpet sounds, it's too late to get ready. But at this time, he is calling us like the Jewish people there, sanctify yourselves. Wash your clothes. What does that mean? Have, have, um, have clean accounts. If there's somebody you have to talk to, somebody you have to get right with, do that. If there's something in your own life, confess it to the Lord. He will cleanse it away. But deal with these things. Because the time is coming when the trumpet will sound. Then it is too late to get ready. It's too late to prepare. It's too late to get those garments in order. He's calling us to prepare for his coming. Because the trumpet is going to sound on the day when we do not know. Now, um, what I'd like to do, we'll be finishing off, if we could stand, uh, we're going to have the sounding of the trumpet. And uh, this is a, a video clip that goes on for a while. But what I want you to do is just, um, just think for a moment what... Uh, is there anything that you need to prepare? Is there something you need to do differently? Let's say if the Lord was suddenly to return in a short while from now, would you do something different than assuming that you've got a life that will last for 50, 60 years more? So let's... Um, uh, if we can all stand uh, and... We will we'll start off with, with the trumpet and then we'll go into a bit of a time of, of prayer together. But first, we'll just, just be silent and just um, uh, perhaps even just close your eyes and listen, listen to the sound of the trumpet as it sounds and say, Lord, am I ready? Am I ready? Let's pray. Let's prepare our hearts to, to hear the sound of the trumpet. It's a moment between you and the Lord. Are you ready for that trumpet to sound? What will you do on that day?
as the trumpet is continuing to sound. Perhaps we can individually spend a bit of time in prayer, uh, praying in particular for people that we know who may not be ready for that time or the trumpet to sound. What I'd like you to do is just join me in just praying in the Spirit for a bit as the trumpet is sounding and, and pray for a breakthrough in these people's lives that they will hear the Lord trying to shake them awake, that they will hear and be ready for His coming. Sudeke, kudeke, sudeke. So teach us how to pray, Lord. Sudeke, kudeke, for our friends, Lord God, for our relatives. Sudeke, kudeke, that they will awaken, Lord, to the sound of the shofar. Sudeke, kudeke, for people who do not know you, Lord God, who have refused to listen to you, who have turned, Lord, a deaf ear to you. I pray you will awaken them, Lord God. Sudeke, sudeke. Lord God, that we will hear, Lord God, they will hear the sound. They will hear and see the message behind the shakings at this time. That, Lord, you are trying to awaken your people because you've got a good plan. You've got a good purpose purpose or you want people to be in the kingdom be ready for your coming have their garments cleansed and have their garments pure join us in prayer just keep on praying in tongues Lord, somebody once prayed over me that I would be awakening people with a shofar. And I pray this today for the people who are here, that they will awaken people with a shofar, so to speak. That they will awaken people to the reality, Lord God, of life, Lord God, of your, of your kingdom, Lord God, of the coming King. That the people who are here, Lord God, will have that spark, Lord God, which will ignite something in other people's hearts. That they will hear, Lord God, and they will know that this is a time, Lord God, this is a time to make sure they are ready and they are right with you. So stir, Lord God, your fire in your people, Lord God, I pray. So that we'll be a people who will blow the shofar. We'll be a people who awaken others, Lord God, to the purpose that you have at this time. So that can could okay. Could okay, so that can could okay. Lord, we want to be ready. We want to be found doing what you call us to do when you come. We want to be ready, Lord God. Lord, awaken your church across this land. Awaken your church across Australia. Awaken your church across this land, Lord God. That we'll be awake, Lord God, to what you are doing at this time. That we'll be mobilized in your army, Lord, as the trumpet is sounding, awakening your people. We mobilize and you are mobilized to do everything you call us to do, to stand together as one, Lord God, one in the, in the Lord. So that can across the boundary lines, across the denominational hindrances, stand together, Lord God, for your purposes to be accomplished, Lord. So that can, so that can awaken and arise, army of God, arise, army of God in this nation. Arise in the name of Jesus. Let's continue to take this time to commit your life afresh to the Lord. So that can, so that can, so that can, so that can. It says in the scriptures that blessed are those who know the joyful sound. And the word in Hebrew is the same word that's used for the blowing of the shofar. Blessed are those who know that sound. You are blessed as you are hearing this sound because the Lord is wanting you to be one who hears, one who is ready and one who is alert. As the trumpet is sounding every year in Israel, they're preparing themselves for the coming of the Messiah. Now we know He is coming a second time. And you are blessed as you are one who is ready and watching. You are blessed as you're one who recognizes that sound. Just one final note uh, Melissa was mentioning about liberty, about freedom. And uh, I don't have time to talk about it today, but many believe we are heading into what's known as the year of Jubilee, the year of liberty. This is a time when they would proclaim liberty throughout the land. It happens after the seventh year and it is known as a super Shemitah because at that time they would not harvest the land again for a second year straight. And at that time, God will restore people back to the ancient possessions. What they had lost in the past was being restored. The things that belonged to them that had been taken away was given back to them. It was a time for them to inherit the ancient destinies of their forefathers. The land that had been given to the forefathers, the plan God had for the forefathers, was now being restored to the children. And this is a time when God is restoring things in our lives where he's bringing us back to things that might have been lost. Even things that are blessings from our parents that maybe hasn't quite come in, into our own lives. But God is going to restore back the land of your forefathers, the land, the promises that he had for the people before you. So this is a year 
what is known as a super, super Shemitah. It's a year known as the acceptable year of the Lord. So let's be ready. Let's be ready for what He has in mind for this year. Let's be ready to step into a new season, a season and a year of jubilee, a year of freedom, freedom and liberty.